And I'm not really hating on anybody because I was in this situation. Hello everybody, this is Ryan over at High Carb Regenerator. Welcome to my channel. Um, if you're new here, like, subscribe. Somebody asked me the other day, gosh, it was probably a week ago now, what's the best way to start keto? I'm like, you gotta be kidding me. Have you seen my channel? Have you seen any of my channel? So I figured why not get start off with the best way to start keto. Why I stopped doing keto. Your key foods are bacon, eggs, avocado, nuts, really high fat. Sounds like the thing of heart attacks. I mean, if you want a heart attack, that is a good plan right there. Fat foods and like zero to like very little carbs is what you're eating all day. There were also some parts about keto for me that just I didn't feel very natural. I mean, one being like, you know, having fruit would almost go against the fruit's dangerous it's got sugar keto diet i mean just to give you guys some context and just just as an example eating one banana in your day would kick you out of ketosis like it's that strict so i think that started to make me feel a little like deprived in the sense that i didn't feel like i had a lot of freedom of choice in terms of food which do they live on a train that cab has a dent in it like, do you hear this noise? With keto diet, so it was hard for me to not feel a little deprived. I felt satiated, but I did also feel deprived in, in terms of choice. I don't know, I got a little tired of it. So that was a big factor. Another one was the amount of hair loss I had. Yeah, I had it too. I noticed in the shower, my hair was falling out, like really alarming amounts falling out when I <clears throat> put my hand through my hair and just look down and but clearing out the drain it was so like so much more frequent than i ever had before that was actually freaking me out and i know that's like a vibe, like a deficiency since you're once you go really low carb it's supposed to be a side effect so you're start, supposed to start taking more magnesium and electrolytes to supplement it and i just i don't know i didn't, it didn't but i thought only vegans needed supplements it feel natural to me to do that and to yeah i get that a lot from carnivores only vegans need supplements <laughs> To like go replenish it with this so that i didn't love i never felt so energetic in my life the flip side to that was that it completely affected my uh sleeping cycle i was yeah because you're dying and your body's like i need real food I wasn't sleeping at night like i was like staring at the ceiling i felt like i could work out at 3 a.m sounds like math but it was so not that I've taken it, but I've seen people who have, I've worked with people who have, I'm like, bro, you just don't stop. It just doesn't, I mean, they just keep working. It, it was, it was really neat at first. I was like, you know, working at night and just doing stuff, staying busy, but it just, again, didn't feel natural to not sleep. I love sleep. I wanted to sleep. It's like my mind wanted to, but my body wasn't going to let me. So, uh, I guess go watch this video if you feel like going through the rest of it. I wanted to go into, man, I pulled up a lot of videos here. Which one is this? This is Nathan Pritikin talking about something. Let's see. A diabetic. All right. So this is Pritikin talking about diabetes here. With severe hypertension in 1949, he said the rice diet of Dr. Walter Kempner had three times as much carbohydrate in as the diet the diabetic was on. And yet he found that the increase of carbohydrates required no increase in insulin. He said, like many other physicians who had this experience, I was reluctant to either fully accept the implications or to follow up the findings adequately. Now, the reason for his confusion was from the time that insulin was first used in our country, the way a physician worked it out, they'd feed the diabetics a certain amount of carbohydrates, and then they give them a certain amount of insulin. And they consider one balance the other, and so they had to hold that carbohydrates <coughs> just right, because the idea was that insulin taking diabetic didn't have any of their own insulin, and if you double the amount of carbohydrates, then you'd have to double the amount of insulin. Well, Dr. West was quite surprised when he tripled the carbohydrates and it required no more insulin. He said, however, in 1960 again, I did study another severely diabetic patient, and after a suitable time, I doubled their carbohydrates. Again, there is no change in insulin requirement. In the process of preparing a publication of this discovery, I was surprised to find that very similar experiments had been done before 1935 by him. And yet they try to put you on 
on this this keto diet with man uh stephenson the explorer the arctic explorer that some of you may have remembered some years ago went on an all meat diet under the auspices of the american meat institute and his cholesterol went up above 600 and he went up 600 almost to 700 so you certainly can get cholesterol levels up if you're going to eat enough meat and enough cholesterol no, primates and humans act very much the same. Fortunately, uh, we now know that it's possible to reverse artery closure in humans. We have studies proven by coronary angiogram and other angiogram studies. We have demonstrated reversal in not only the coronary arteries, but that's been demonstrated by Dr. Henry Buckwell, University of Minnesota Medical School, uh, reversal of uh, kidney artery closure demonstrated by Dr. Basta, who at that time was with the University of Iowa Medical School. Femoral artery in the legs reversal demonstrated by Dr. David Blankenhorn, also demonstrated by our own studies. We've also demonstrated reversal of iliac artery closure. So there's no question that narrowed or closed arteries can reverse themselves and reopen in humans. The question is, how do we get it to apply for the whole general population? Well, studies that have indicated how to lower cholesterol level, of course, are around. And there are certain population differences right in the United States. For example, you have the Seventh-day Adventists. Now, they're on three different kinds of diets. They're on the regular American diet. They're on a sort of um, dairy products and vegetarian diet and are on a sort of a pure vegetarian diet. And the, the Seventh-day Adventists are a good group because they're mixed with the whole population. And we find that in that population, those on the lowest cholesterol intake have the least amount of heart disease and also the least amount of breast cancer. And there you go. The clinic tells us that he's seen 20-year-olds that have been on these high-protein diets, a steak for breakfast and so on, already with kidney damage. Kidney damage. I was through that. And I try, I'm, this is why I preach so much about against the keto thing. Athletes, 20-year-old athletes, sort of a tragedy that the high-protein diet has been so misunderstood as to damage kidneys already at 20 years old with our athletes. Now, a high-protein diet has nothing to say good for it. And yet, think of all the weight reduction diets. These are high-protein diets. The Atkins diet, the Stillman diet, the Scarsdale diet. And a good reason for these diets uh, is that they do lose weight. And how do they lose weight? Well, they do it very simply. The high protein diet is only about 75% efficient as far as becoming, going into calories. Almost one fourth of the protein goes into waste products. We call these ammonia products. Yes, and this is why I smelled like vinegar or a cleaning solution all day long, all day long. It's the same ammonia as you have in smelling salts. If you've ever smelled ammonium smelling salt, you know that it's a pretty, uh, pretty strong material. And you can't get rid of it. I don't. You can take a 30 showers an hour. You can uh, wear the strongest cologne on the planet. It just doesn't go away. Well, I can tell you that the ammonia is poisonous <clears throat> to your body cells too. So the first thing that the body does is convert that ammonia byproduct from protein breakdown into what we call urea nitrogen and uric acid. And these now have to be gotten out. And that is why I was throwing up stomach acid, most likely at night. Uh, of the body, so the body doesn't become poisonous. And that's the principal constituent of urine. Uh, that's where the term comes from, from the urea nitrogens and the nitrogen waste products from protein waste. Now, on a high-protein diet, the problem is that the problems, again, are so toxic to the body, the body must dilute them with a lot of water to reduce their poisonous effect. It takes seven times as much water to dilute the problems of protein uh, digestive breakdown per calorie than it does of carbohydrates or fat. So that with that much water required, and if you're on a high-protein diet, you can lose five pounds of weight in 24 hours. How do you do that? Well, you lose four and a half pounds of water to wash out all those poisonous products and maybe a half a pound of tissue weight. So that's why those in high protein diets have almost 
and immediate weight loss in 24 hours. They've dehydrated themselves. Now, this is sort of a tragedy that children had. It used to be that infants, and especially premature infants, had these high-protein milk formulas like soy milk and so on fed to them. And these infants would die in two or three weeks of dehydration until they found out what the problem was. So and that's what you're doing to yourself. Well, that you certainly don't want to, for all the many reasons, be on a high-protein diet. I couldn't say it better myself. Tom Myers are on. That's a diet I'm recommending to you. Diabetes is an ancient disease that has been written in the Egyptian hieroglyphics over 3,000 years ago. And in those days, when one of the royalty developed diabetes, the physicians were very smart. They simply put them on the peasant's diet, which is the kind of diet we would recommend to you, of grains, fruits, and vegetables, and the diabetes disappeared. Then they send them back to the royalty again, where they had very rich foods, high in fat, and they, when they got the diabetes again, they came back to the peasants. So for hundreds and so hundreds eat of like years, a peasant. Eat like a peasant. If you, if anybody reads the Bible or even the uh, the Torah, or, or I haven't really touched the Quran, but um, they talk about being humble and and stuff like that. That's that's one of the humble. I think, aspects of life. Electrodes from electrocardiographic equipment, monitor their blood to see how much fat was in their blood, and then you fed them a glass of heavy cream. Four to five hours after the glass of heavy cream, he registered 14 angina attacks, and yet they were just comfortable in his office, doing nothing special, just letting... And that's what your keto diet's doing to you. <laughs> and people do it. The fat get into the blood, Make the cells sticking together, block the small vessels, and creating coronary insufficiency. The electrocardiographic results also demonstrated coronary insufficiency, whereas in the beginning, there wasn't any. Now, Dr. Crow wanted to see if it was the amount of fluid that these people had or what it was, so a short time later, he gave the same patients a drink that had no fat at all, but the same amount of fluid and the same amount of calories. Four to five hours after the test, there wasn't a single angina attack, not a single abnormality in the electrocardiogram. We've established through the... But have your protein and fat, so you have your little little attacks there. All right, here's McDougal. And I'm not really hating on anybody, because I was in this situation, probably should have, should have said that at the beginning. Um, but I've been through this and it, this was 10 gosh this was um 12 years ago now and i still this is like 13 years ago i still deal with some of the effects like if i have too much beans in like say a week like if i have a bunch of beans in a day it's not really a big deal but if i go on a kick like uh mcdougall speaking of mcdougall here he has the best bean and corn soup on the planet <laughs> All right, it's just so amazing. So I make it, and sometimes if I have it like four or five days in a week because it's just so good, I'll notice I have kidney issues again. And how do I notice that low low back pain? Uh, you know, it's almost impossible to get my urine clear again, and just different things. Uh, sometimes the liver will hurt a little bit. It's just. There's different signs that you kind of, at least from dealing with it from so many years now, you kind of recognize, and it's just like I have to back off. I'll actually back off from beans for like for the rest of the month, <clears throat> or at least two, two or three weeks. You know, and somebody asked me yesterday, maybe it was two days ago now, uh, do I eat a lot of beans? And I don't. Um, if you don't have kidney issues, and my kidney issues aren't as anywhere near what they used to be. Um, then you'll be fine. I know McDougal says you can get away with, I think, a pound a day or something. Or is it eight ounces? I don't know. It's either eight or 16 ounces a day. Hello, I'm Dr. John McDougal. I've been writing books for almost uh, 30 years now. <clears throat> and my books were very popular in the 1970s. And the wow, I didn't know they went that back that far. That must be the 12-day thing. The 12-day program or whatever it's called. I actually have that somewhere. 1980s, they were still popular, but then a change took place, and that is that people switched from high carbohydrate, starch based diets, to low carbohydrate. I kind of have a backstory on that. So, my dad worked in a food distribution plant that had a retail uh, part, and he was the manager of the entire retail end. 
And he said that people would be in competition with themselves on how much they could spend on on seafood every night. And I remember this because he would bring home seafood quite a bit in the 80s. Uh, and then a little bit in the 90s, but it was a competition. And I know everybody had a ton of money in the 80s. If you weren't around in the 80s, that I mean, I feel I feel bad for you. It was just such a great era. But people really were trying to pump in that uh, animal protein. And that's when you really started seeing hospitals pop up more than, I mean, there's more hospitals now, I swear, than apartments. Meat, dairy, and egg-based diets. My publishers actually came to me and said, McDougal, you're going to have to change your way of writing. You must now teach people to eat high protein, high fat, low carb diets, like the Atkins diet. And I said, no, I'm not gonna do that. These diets are proved to be dangerous. And I said, besides, do you think I just write books to make a living? I do it because I believe in rich, what I teach. Well, these low carb diets, like the Atkins diet, the uh, carbohydrate addicts diet, the zone diet, these diets have been very popular, I think because people find them easy to adjust to. And after all, to be on the Atkins diet, after all you have to do is go through the fast food restaurant, order your meal, throw away the bun, scrape off the ketchup and pickle, and you're on the Atkins diet. So it's familiar, it's easy. Uh, the results are quite profound. You get sick enough on these kinds of diets so that you lose a lot of water weight, and you also lose uh, some body weight, but you only stay sick for so long. And finally you say, I can't take this anymore, I feel horrible. Yeah, the binges, they hit. You'll eat an entire apple pie or something like that. It's crazy. Well, I'm constipated. At least if you're my size anyway. I got bad breath, I got headaches, things are not going well, so you go off that low-carb diet, and of course you gain all the weight back very quickly. Obese. People get mad at me for saying that, and I say it anyway. Uh, these diets have been shown to promote kidney stones as well as heart disease. What, what would you expect with all that meat and eggs and dairy? You think this is rocket science? To and I'm not saying I'm skinny by any means. I, I get to hear about it in the comments. But I... um. I was 405. It got to that point. It was 405. It was, it was, it was not great. Figure out these things are dangerous. And as I mentioned, they're temporary because you can't stay sick forever. Why don't you get on a program that works for a lifetime? One that most people who have ever walked this planet have lived on. And that's a diet that's starch based, a diet based, based on corn, rice, potatoes, beans, all kinds of delicious dishes, the things that we recommend. Then you get a permanent solution as far as losing the excess weight, being vigorous like an athlete and avoiding serious diseases like uh, cancer and heart disease. It's a simple change. Don't go on those low-carb diets. I'm Dr. J there you go. Simple. I'm sure people going on keto haven't made it this far, but hopefully they have. If, if you know somebody on it, what in the world? <laughs> if you know somebody on the, the keto diet who's really struggling, I guess maybe, <laughs> maybe send them this, uh, this video and they get to see sushi and... I support single moms. Oh, do you know what, what do you eat for dinner? What do I eat for dinner? And how late would I eat dinner? I've got a full stomach right now. Oh, feels good to be able to eat. Feels good to, I don't have to restrict my food. That, that shirt is righteous. It's like a spirit animal. Like every meal I get to eat. Look at these sleeves, dude. Carbohydrate is sweet. Well, save the carbohydrate foods as I want. That feels fucking incredible. But I don't have to cow restrict. You know, I don't have to run on stimulants. I don't have to smoke a cigarette or take a pill to avoid eating food and distract my hunger. I get to eat my fruit, my starches, and my sugars in abundance. I go, what do I want to have for breakfast? I want to have sweet or savory. For breakfast, it's always savory, uh, sweet for me. Sweet for me always. Lunch, mostly sweet, maybe some more savory. If you ever have a savory meal and want something sweet afterwards, it means you didn't give your body enough simple sugars before the meal. I learned this from Doug Graham back in the day. Back when I was doing the 100% raw food, sort of fruitarian style, I'd like want some. It's actually a really good tip. Savory, and afterwards oh, I want something sweet, and you have it after sweet afterwards, and you, oh, it doesn't digest so good. No, you cannot combine. Cannot combine. You can add sugar to like when I make a sauce. Uh, even even a pasta sauce. I did this last night. I added a bunch of sugar to it. It, it really, you know, anybody who likes Chef Boyardee, the reason you like Chef Boyardee so much, if anybody's had it, I don't. I think they're still around. Um. The reason they were so good is they added a ton of sugar to that stuff. If you add sugar into a pasta sauce, you will be reminded of Chef Boyardee. We weren't allowed to have it in my house, but my 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 best friend that's that's you know they kind of lived in canned food, and um, well not lived, but I mean they, there was a lot more of it around, 
And I, it brings back that memory of like cracking open that can, and, and uh, it was just so good. So I disciplined myself that I always gave my sweet first. If I ever want sweet afterwards, didn't have enough sweet beforehand. So if you want perfect digestion, a flatter stomach, better breathing as a runner and as a cyclist. The breathing, I mean, anybody can hear my videos. Sometimes I do struggle with, I do have a deviated septum too. So breathing isn't always the easiest, but uh, the more weight you lose, it, it's, it's crazy how much easier you can breathe. You want to have that diaphragmatic efficiency with better food combining or let you breathe better. That's free speed. Uh, a few days ago, I ran a 16.50 for 5K. My PR is 1635. I've ran 338 Ks this year. That's fuck all training for most runners out there. Ask any runners on the running, let's run.com. That's not much training at all. 338 Ks for a year? That's less than a K a day. But I'm running 1650 for 5K and my PR is in the 14s. Or I don't know what any of this means. He asked me the other day in my uh, DMs, um, you know, how fast can you run a 5K? And I'm like, I have no idea. I'm built for lifting, not running. But I can ride fast. 12s at 1635 <clears throat> so i'm running pr level fitness on bare bones training and a lot of that is to nutrition it's due to my nutrition and also having a flat stomach i find it interesting that the i would guess native trees to australia don't change colors but the ones apparently not native are changing that cab has a dent in it Better. or that's just the sun your belly that's where all your power comes from as a runner as a cyclist the oxygen fuels your red blood cells, the hemoglobin, fuels the legs with the sugars, the glucose derived ATP gets the action going. And stimulants, I'm not in any stimulants right now. I very, very rarely take stimulants because I don't need to. I have a story about this. I know I keep cutting in, but so I, everybody know, well, anybody who watches my videos know I do the, uh, the DoorDash thing. And I had to do a delivery to somebody who works in a Starbucks the other day. Oh. I could not get out of there fast enough. I have never liked coffee. I've never liked the smell of coffee. It just, it's like vomitous. I actually almost vomited one time when somebody put it right up to my nose. And I was in there and this girl that I handed this thing to, she was like, oh, do you, you want me to make you a drink? I'm like, mm, no. And I'm like, like, you know, like, and she's like, are you sure? And I'm like, I'm like, I can't really run because of my ankle. And I'm like, I'm like trying to run out of this place. And she's like, she keeps asking me. I'm like, bro. I gotta go and i'm said i sorry thank you hope you have a good day and then i ran out i get enough sleep i get enough water i get enough sugar sometimes i take them just to erase that something just to get an extra couple half percent maybe but you'll never ever see me at a cafe just sitting there drinking coffee so i can talk with people that's one of the worst things you can do for your health and one of the worst things you do for your fitness taking drugs so you can talk to people and socialize after training you after training you want to have some water have some carbohydrates, simple sugars, maybe some starches later on, and just chill. Just chill. So you get all your cortisone and your catecholamines and everything just flowing, all those enzymes of recovery, your hormones, your testosterone, your estrogen, get all these things flowing so it can aid your recovery process. Finish training, drinking coffee or green tea, worst thing you can do with your fitness. And that's one reason I can be so fit at age 41 is because my stimulant usage over the last... Okay. So... When I minimize these, you can see these, the titles, if you want to go look these things up. And do I have one more? So you can see here, this is before, the before photo, I'm six foot tall. Th this dude looks like a Schindler's List uh, wannabe. This is nuts. 54 kilos, and on the right is... This is steroids. This is off steroids. <laughs> Full natty, fake natty. This is this, is this But he at least uh, discloses. Month. Um, 80 kilos, six foot tall. So it's after sunbathing, before and after sunbathing. You sort of see progression photos there on the left, starting to gain a bit more muscle. I think he just wanted to show off. And that's on the far right, that's this. That's all this video is. So here's the blood tests. Here, yeah, here's the vitamin D. We just buffed out the, uh, the deets. This is done on March. People say, oh, it's, it's October. And this is in Australia. We do the month. In the second bit, so 10th of March. This dude should not redact for the government. You can still read this stuff. We're now in April. So see, it raised my vitamin D from sunbathing. Sunbathing my kiwi fruits in the sun. And then we have uh, testosterone with that. 52 <laughs> nanomoles a litre. <laughs> One time years ago, I had... 
Uh, ours don't. Uh, it goes by nanogram per deciliter, and I think the cutoff is like nine hundred or a thousand. Mine was like thirteen hundred. But this is when they were trying to figure out my testosterone issues because my pituitary gland has like some kind of weird uh, nodule on it or something. And I never felt better in my life. <laughs> I'm like, bro, I want to stay here. And they wouldn't let me. I needed, I should have found a doctor who was a little more open. So almost double the top, so top tier. And it, it lowered my SHBG as well. All right, so how high is your testosterone? Look at mine, bro. You know, do you even do you even testosterone, bro? <laughs> do you even testosterone? Have those who say, oh, and this is a dude who eats bananas, rice, sugar. Anyway, hopefully you've made it this far in the video. If you did, like, subscribe, do all that fun stuff. Comment questions down below. Uh, if you want me to keep making videos like this, uh, let me know down in the section. I'll probably do it anyway. Um, but share this video to people who are on keto and struggling, and people who are thinking about keto. It is so bad for you. It's not even funny. Anyway. Talk to you next time.